Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. You know, we've been always saying that during this crisis, the question has always been, can Jay Powell over there at the Federal Reserve and other central bankers inflate or reflate or pump up uh, quick enough to avert any downdraft in the stock market? I know economically that's got a lot of problems associated with it that but that's the big question Stacy it is all about this one issue that you and I particularly you have been talking about for years you used to be an options trader and what is options trading all about but uh, managing risk right well that was a tool developed to manage risk but when that didn't work all the time a hundred percent of the time bankers got their friends like Jay Powell let's uh, look at uh, this tweet from you are you ready for Monday J Powell goes brrrr. Again, my Spanish comes in handy there to know how to roll those R's. But once their risk management tools, starting in 1987 when the portfolio insurance crashed the market, the Fed came in to the rescue, and that's the Fed put. Well, then we've seen since that any time that the bankers and all their huge massive derivatives Whenever there's a problem there, the Fed comes to the rescue. I.e., there's a problem with distribution of risk and the supply chain of risk doesn't go away. The risk is still there, but it just keeps on getting deferred either into the future or to some group of suckers like, you know, pension funds. Risk uh, cannot be created or destroyed. It's persistent within the uh, markets. And options and derivatives allow you to separate risk from reward and to trade it separately. That's what the options volatility formula which was a Nobel winning prize winning formula is all about to split almost like you're splitting energy from matter. You're splitting risk from reward. And so what bankers on Wall Street have been really good at doing is making sure that they don't have any risk and that that risk somehow always manages to end up in pension accounts or in the labor markets where labor never seems to make decent wages and they get the reward. And uh, that's how you have this wealth and income gap develop over 30 or 40 years is because uh, it's uh, the ability to make rewards with zero risk has become very efficient for those in the banking business, friends of Wall Street, et cetera. So this current crisis, the COVID-19 crash, we had this enormous drawdown, trillions of trillions of dollars of market value evaporated on one day. The question was, can the Fed and central banks do another risk trick to make sure that their protected friends do not have to take any losses. And so they increase that derivative pile to uh, in extraordinary levels. That's where you see the evidence of this risk trickery is in the derivatives market. And you can quantify that and get an understanding of exactly how big this market is. And at the moment, it looks like they are being successful in making sure that the Wall Street folks will not be bearing any of the negative consequences of this COVID-19 crisis. You could always tell when a con is happening, when it's, there's a lot of complexity. And there's so much complexity about even this latest stimulus package, which looks like it's a benevolent gift to the people. But in fact, there's trillions more in exotic instruments of stimulus package that reflects the exotic instruments of debt packages that are being bailed out. So you'll never be able to understand that. But in terms of simple numbers, where you can find the fraud, where you can see the con happening is in certain numbers. And in terms of risk being deferred, let's look at what happened in the meat space. And this is a remarkable chart from New York City. This is a, a chart of New York City and the cases per thousand or 100,000 people. So it's showing you how dangerous certain areas of of New York are. You see the darker it is that it's poorer areas, the Bronx, Queens, this is uh, Elmhurst area, which is in the news around the world with the worst hospitals there overrun, Rikers Island, Brooklyn around JFK and Staten Island. These are where all the working class live. Those people having to work, those people who are essential to the economy have been deemed essential, the food delivery services, supermarket workers, pharmacy workers, all those sort of people, they're getting infected, while the banking class right there in Manhattan, where you don't see any a very low level of cases relative to the rest. Politically speaking, the term is gerrymandering. So gerrymandering is when you have political subdivisions created within a state 
or a region to allow for political manipulation and for the interests of the moneyed class to be protected and the interest of the poor to be continuously exploited. That's gerrymandering. So in financial markets, financial gerrymandering is this risk trickery that I'm speaking about. And so like a pension fund is in the poor neighborhood because it has no way to protect itself from derivative risk reassignment into their pension accounts. Uh, and, that, and that reward is kept by the hedge funds and it's dumped into pension funds. Pension funds are a toxic waste dump of risk. This ger financial gerrymandering means that the returns are always going to be horrible. And so, yeah, politically, you see that happening quite starkly by that map you're showing. You see the regions cut up, and that's because of political gerrymandering in an attempt to exploit the p political divisioning to sustain status quo. Well, exactly. That map, what it's saying in, in the meat space is reflected in our financial space, and in particular, the monetary and economic risks that are being offloaded onto the ordinary person since 2000, but especially 2008, and then now this crash, what we've seen is that interventions from the Fed have taken any of the like little risk that the, the bankers are taking themselves through their bonuses and their profit margins and like JP Morgan stressing out over whether or not to pay a dividend and can they stop paying their dividend? They don't want to risk that, so they take that through inflation, through the, the quantitative easing, through NERP, through all these policies of taking their packages of risk, all their derivative packages off the balance sheet of the banks, and now hedge funds and private equity, and now they also might, the Fed might be starting to buy uh, ETFs and muni bonds, and so they're taking the risk of all the powerful onto the balance sheet, and that balance sheet is your balance sheet. That's the ordinary American's balance sheet, the 335 million who aren't the elite. They're the ones that are risking not only their currency and possibly a hyperinflation in the future, and that's a, a political event when people lose faith in the actual currency. So you're seeing that offloading of risk to the opposite of you know, that map shows exactly the people taking risk in the economy and in the monetary system. The leader in all this would be Japan, right? They took their uh, debt to GDP, passed 100% of GDP, they passed 200%, they're, I think, at 300%. And so America's going to be at 100% very soon. So to get to 300%, that's another 40, 50, 60 trillion in debt which I fully expect them to do. Look, the, the free market capitalism has its roots in the work of Adam Smith and the Enlightenment, in this, in which also brought us in that age, uh, Darwin and the, uh, his work in terms of evolution and natural selection. And this was uh, echoed by uh, Schumpeter, I believe, with his idea of creative destruction, that there's a churn in nature and in economics where it's all as hues toward perfection and excellence and survival. And that is, uh, when, you, when you snap that connection and by rewarding the freaks and rewarding the, the colonial masters, America now has become a colonial empire of hedge funds that have colonized America and this goes completely against anything anyone could interpret from the Constitution. And they, they, they derive their power from the Federal Reserve Bank, which is a, a successor to the Bank of England. And the Bank of England, according to Ben Franklin, was the number one reason America staged the American Revolution, to get away from the Bank of England, because that was the sponsor of colonialism. Now we have the Fed, which is the sponsor of the new American colonialism of hedge funds. You know, Citadel, one of the biggest hedge funds, they, they, they're not embarrassed by hiring Ben Bernanke, former Fed chairman, to come over there. And during this bailout process, Bernanke is a direct colonial connection to a monopolist oligarchical hedge fund to the Federal Reserve. And they're negotiating, and they're front-running, and they're high-frequency trading, and they're trading derivatives, and they are interfering like a gerrymandering ghetto blaster booster political hack to undermine our lives in a, in a, and so we have this emerging underclass 
of people living out there in zombie land. And the uh, next step will be to vilify them and to um, scapegoat them and to say that they're less than human. And then we know where that goes. Let's continue on this theme of the supply chain of risk because there's always risk in the world, in nature. The antelope bouncing across the field has to get to you know, her family or friends over there, but the risk is a lion's gonna eat you, right? That's the risk, and that's why they develop, that's why they can run so fast and jump. That's like their evolutionary defense against the lion attacking them and, and ripping them to pieces. But here we have a system which is so stale now because there is no risk for the lion has a risk as well. The lion has the risk of possibly starving to death because the antelope is way too fast for it and it can't catch the antelope. So, you know, th there is, there's supposed to be a distribution of risk and each member develops a defense mechanism. They have deferred all the risk that they should have been taking and because they were handsomely rewarded for taking risk on your behalf. So let's look at the what the cost is going to be. Of the so far six trillion, there's now a phase four. They're gonna add more trillions to future liabilities. And here is what Moody's is saying. Moody says, expect US federal debt to rise to around 93% of GDP in 2020 from 79% last year in 2019 and continue its upward path to about 120% by 2030. By 2030, there ain't gonna be any boomers in the economy having to work and, and subsidize this. That's going to be on Generation Z, especially. They're going to be emerging into this, graduating from university into that economy, uh, laden with this debt to pay off all that risk taken by the likes of Jamie Dimon, Lloyd Blankfein, every single hedge fund now and, and, and private equity guy on Wall Street. Yes, it'll be a permanent weight on the economy for gen millennials, Gen Z, and subsequent generations who will have to live under the enormous cloud of having debt two to 300% of GDP, making it virtually impossible to compete. You can only marginally survive. As you said, risk doesn't disappear. It's just been rolled over into the future. You cannot create or destroy risk. You can only move it around. And if you can move it around successfully, you become billionaire. Hey, we're gonna take a break. When we come back, much more coming your way. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to Chicago and talk with John Najarian, old friend. Happy to have him on the show today. He's also the co-founder of Market Rebels. And of course, he is the star of CNBC's Halftime Report. John, welcome. Hey, Max. Great to be back with you. Feels like much more than a month since you and Stacy and I were at Tone Vey's conference uh, out in Vegas. It, that was a good time but it just preceded all the bad times that we're in right now. I feel that we were uh, just ahead of the wave as it, as it was crashing everywhere across the country. And we got out of town. Uh, you know, Vegas obviously is pretty hard hit by all this. And, you know, I wanted to have you explain a little bit to folks. You know, we talk about trading a lot. We talk about Bitcoin. We talk about stocks and bonds and macro. And um, I want to talk a little bit about the regional difference between New York and Chicago, because it's a very important two financial centers in America, and they feed off each other sometimes. Sometimes they are competing with each other. Uh, but how do you see that relationship, Chicago versus New York, John? In all deference, Max, to the uh, uh, friends of mine on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, they don't have traders on the floor for the most part. Those folks are very good at what they do, but they are brokers, not traders, on the New York floor. Um, and of course, they're gone, just as the Chicago traders are gone, um, because they couldn't figure out a safe way to keep several hundred people uh, on the floor of either the Chicago Board Option Exchange or the Merck uh, slash Board of Trade. So they basically shuttered the floors, and everything went on either Globex, in the case of uh, the commodities exchanges or uh, on any of the myriad of electronic exchanges for the SIBO and the rest of the derivatives exchanges. So the big difference, I think, Max, is there used to be um, about, let's say, give or take 250 people left on the floor of the CBOE. Um, now they call it SIBO Global Markets, but they were in the VIX pit, S&P 500, and the triple Q. Now they're gone. 
they're all upstairs um, and they're having a really hard time trading uh, from upstairs as most of us did, Max, when I, I migrated upstairs 2004. So, you know, it's been 16 years that I've been upstairs. All those traders that are used to still being on the floor, um, they are trying to survive in a brave new world and having a very hard time doing it. And because of that, there's more volatility, even more than there would have been otherwise during this drop. So you're saying that the key role of market making on the floor by traders with their ear to the market who are looking at actual trades as they take place, in the absence of that, with the migration of more trading upstairs, as you call it, uh, and more reliance maybe on computer trading, the volatility is increasing. So you, you, you are positing there that there's a vital role for humans to uh, play in these markets and maybe a migration to purely electronic markets, we lose something, is that correct? That is what I'm saying exactly, Max. Instead of having hundreds of traders in a pit where they all hear the same information at the exact same second, now they're all upstairs responding to whatever they're looking at. Some of them are watching Bloomberg or CNBC or Fox News. Some of them are just on squawk boxes, you know, hoot and hollers, we used to call them, Max, where people are just giving them color, if you will, for orders, you're not seeing every order. And since you're not seeing every order, um, you're backing off. Your bids and offers are much wider. Um, and I posited back then, before it happened, that this would increase volatility if it, in and of itself. And certainly it has since the, I think it was 17th or so of March. In the derivatives market and in the options market, it was the beginning of a momentous occasion in the whole history of securities in that the options volatility formula from the late 70s, early 80s, you had the ability to separate risk from reward and separate risk as an, as an entirely separate asset class. And this is what people don't understand these days when they talk about the wealth and income gap. A lot of it has to do with the fact that the top one tenth of 1% knows how to trade pure risk to hedge themselves and to profit from volatility, whereas the vast majority of people are, tends to be where that risk ends up going. Uh, classic toxic risk dump being a pension fund that's passively managed and just ends up accumulating a lot of risk that comes from the Sharpies and the pros who know how to trade risk. Is that, What do you think about that statement? I think it's exactly accurate. Uh, I think that, um, it's true that a minority of people understand about volatility and about derivatives trading, Max. You're, of course, right about that. I think it's out of the 120 million securities accounts in the U.S., only about six or eight million of them even are papered up, meaning that they've signed off on derivative agreements, whether it's futures or options. And you're right. Options and futures are risk transfer vehicles. Um, so if somebody wants to um, basically bet on corn um, having a banner year this year because demand is up or supply is down, those two usually work uh, in concert to push prices up or down. Um, when we've got that, uh, you're transferring the risk of that farmer, in this case of corn, um, over to a speculator or over to a big uh, producer of the end product like Kellogg's or General Mills or whatever. And the same sort of thing works in stocks. Um, there are some folks who are not comfortable with the sort of ups and downs that we see in the stock market. And so they try to set a floor by um, owning some of that protection, if you will, some of that volatility so that they don't suffer when we have these big drawdowns, which we know virtually every year we're going to see at least a 10% drawdown at some point, um, even if it's very sharp and quick and V-shaped. And every once in a while, we get one like we've got right now, Max, which we don't know how long this goes on, but we know the volatility's up and the people that didn't have protection, just to your point exactly, are the ones left holding the bag. In American finance, there is the myth of the lone trader the guy who uh, sticks to his model or has nerves of steel 
and becomes quite wealthy. Uh, there's a whole mini industry around this, the books that go by the name of Trading Wizards and others. And it all goes back to Jesse Livermore and Confessions of a Stock Operator is probably the first book really outlining how to be a professional trader. As you say, there's a difference between a trader and an investor. My question is, here we are in 2020. The volatility is uh, intense. Uh, markets seem to be disconnected in many ways, as you've just described. The trading signals and market signals seem to be throwing off a lot of noise versus signal. But the question is, do the laws and rules that Jesse Livermore laid out in the 20s and the early 30s, do they still apply? Can you still, is, do we still have room in America for the, I think the phrase in Chicago is all you need to be rich is a pencil and a pad of paper, you know, indicating uh, all you need to do is get down there on the floor of the exchange and you have, if you have nerves of steel, you can, you can be a quite, quite wealthy. Is that still working? Is it still alive? The time frame has changed. It used to be, Max, when, because I know you started off and that you were a derivatives trader as well. Um, when we were down on the floor, you know, that we were as immediate as it got because there was no direct interaction into the pit back then. The best you could do is hand signal something into a pit and people would react to it. That was as immediate as it became. Um, and even that was no guaranteed fill. Now, if you point and click on a price, you can have that price. Uh, the problem is that there are a lot of computers that are making those prices and taking those prices, and they do both of those at light speed, at literally as close to the speed of light as the internet or as a direct connection to a data center in a stock market, uh, you know, whether it's Mawa, New Jersey, or Carteret, New Jersey, or wherever the CME has their data center. All of that um, is happening literally at just this far from the speed of light. So if you're trying to point and click and take that market or make a market for one of those, you lose because they are trading and making moves in thousandths of a second, um, much faster than a human being can. So my time frame and virtually every trader I know, Max, has had to move out their time frame to be maybe 10 seconds, 30 seconds, you know, somewhere much longer into the future, which means, of course, that against those machines, you're taking much more risk. So the machines became the market makers um, and we try to be the market takers. Um, and we have to wait, just like you said, with that pad of paper, I've got to sit here and, you know, sort of figure out the levels I want to buy and sell at. And then if we get there, try to execute at that level, knowing that I can't depend on the market on the screen. I have to have my own levels um, that I'm entering because what I see on the screen is already gone. Well, my understanding is that Goldman Sachs is actually working on a way to trade faster than the speed of light so that they could go backwards in time and steal money from clients in the past. Well, if anybody could do it, Goldman could. Right. Now, let's talk, you mentioned about the proximity of technology to the prices. And we heard about this during a lot of talk when high frequency trading was in the news. And high frequency trading relies on proximity of servers to these exchanges. They actually park a computer server next to the exchange to get a fraction of a millisecond advantage. I contend that these guys are siphoning capital out of the markets like somebody would siphon gas out of a neighbor's car and that they're destructive. Lloyd Blankfein uh, argued with Charlie Rose once that they're, no, they're adding liquidity and they're, they're, they're key to the function of the market. How do you see that? They're both right, but um, when Blankfein says what they're doing is adding liquidity, um, those HFTs, high frequency traders, the algorithms and so forth, they're adding liquidity in microseconds. Again, liquidity that you and I can't access, Max, because literally by the time you would see it, by the time your eye sees it, it's already at a different price. Like I say, they're adding liquidity, but at the, only at the same speed of the people that are responding to it. And you and I can't respond in thousandth of a second. So blank finds right, they're adding liquidity, but it's also right that, that whoever is doing this 
has siphoned off billions of dollars right. every single week. This is the problem that that is, I think your analogy is spot on, but it's just like somebody stuffs a hose into your car and is just stealing off, you know, some small percent, hopefully not the whole tank, but they're stealing gas every single minute of every single day. John, we got to cut it off there. Fascinating. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Max. Love you. The love is, is mutual, buddy. All right, well, uh, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. want to thank our guest, John Najarian, out there in Chicago. And you see him at the CNB's Halftime Report all the time when they're up and running. Or on Twitter if you're trying to catch us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.